Hallelujah. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. <clears throat> we are uh, glad of everyone that's here tonight. And uh, I get into this word here that the <clears throat> Lord's put on my heart to share. Uh, if you have your Bibles, you want to turn them to um, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12, where you want to look on the screen either way. Well, we're going to start out there, and I've got a lot of scriptures to give you, <clears throat> as I normally do. But um, uh, tonight, I, I, I just felt led to talk about <clears throat> faith. Um, uh, I, I'm going to, to teach some uh, controversial things about faith, maybe some things about faith that you haven't heard in church or been taught in church about faith, but um, I think it's crucial that we understand these things is because the only thing, way we're going to get anything from God uh, or, or see anything manifest that God has for us or has promised us is by faith. It's the only way to do it, and so I think we've got to understand faith. I teach, I've taught a lot about faith in my ministry. Um, and, uh, it's, it's a, it, it's something that's not explained to the believer. You know, people say, well, I have faith. Well, I believe and and they don't really know what they got faith in or what they're believing or how to do it. They just say, I'm a, I'm a believer. And, and a lot of people say I'm a believer and they're not really believing anything. <laughs> so, um, uh, we're going to talk about some things tonight and, um, uh, I may say some things tonight, just give you a disclaimer that may make you go, hmm, you may not say amen right away, but if I can make you think and get into the Bible, I've done my job, amen? Amen, amen. hallelujah. But let's look here in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. Um, if you will, please just uh, uh, read this out loud with us as Taj gets it up on the screen here or if you're looking in your Bibles. But ready, let's read. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life where unto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Somebody say fight the good fight of faith. Fight the good fight of faith. Hallelujah. Fight the good fight of faith. That's what we want to talk about, I guess, tonight um, is fighting the the good fight of faith. Hallelujah. Um, Father, we're asking for your anointing to take over, think through our minds, speak through our lips, God. And we just want you to show up through this uh, this word tonight, Father, this teaching. Father, let us receive it, God. Give us revelation, Holy Spirit. Let it fall on good ground and produce fruit tonight in the mighty name of Jesus. Somebody say amen. amen. All right. Um, we are in a fight, but what we've got to understand is we are not in a fight with the devil directly. Um, remember, we uh, ministered last Wednesday on the wrestling match. How many members us talking about the wrestling match? <laughs> and uh, we talked about that Jesus uh, on that third day, on that Sunday morning, he leveraged the enemy and put the enemy under his feet and therefore put him under our feet. Once and for all, when he got up out of the ground and the enemy is defeated, he's 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 an adversary, but he's a defeated adversary. And we talked about the fact that that he's under our feet and and the resistance that we feel from him a lot of times is just him trying to get out from under our feet. But we got to keep him there. Amen. But we're in a fight. But it is, according to the word and according to the scripture and according to Paul, it is a faith fight. Somebody say a faith fight. The fight that you're in as a Christian is a faith fight. And your enemy is not necessarily the devil. It is really the enemy of doubt and unbelief. That's your enemy. That's what you're fighting today. Hallelujah. That's the battle that you're in. You're in the battle with doubt. In unbelief. We are in a fight, children of God, 
to stay in faith while we're presented every day with thoughts and images of doubt and unbelief. That's the fight. It's, it's the fight to stay in faith. Hallelujah. And that's what Paul was talking about here with Timothy. He said, I fought a good fight. Uh, or I, I fought the good fight of faith. Now, this is a good fight. And, and, and you might say, well, what's a good fight? Well, any fight that you win is a good fight. Amen. So this is a good fight because it's a fight we win through Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. And so <clears throat> we're in a faith fight. Our enemies is doubt and unbelief. This is what we're combating, and we are trying to stay in faith. Paul told Timothy in another place, he said, I fought a good fight, and the fight he was talking about was this faith fight. And then he said, I've kept my faith. So he got down to the end of his journey, the end of his life, and he said, I won because the devil never got my faith. Come on, somebody. Amen. You win if the devil never gets your faith. Come on. Hallelujah. That's, that's victory right there. Amen. And so Paul said, I've been through all I've been through. I've been through all the persecution, all the, the, the backstabbing, all of the, uh, the things that I faced, the, 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 the messenger of Satan coming to buffet me and uh, through all the stonings and the shipwrecks and the prisons. And he said, I've, I've fought the faith fight. I fought the doubt and unbelief. I've put it under my feet and I've, I've kept the faith. Hallelujah. And so that's what you're in. You're in a faith fight. You're in a fight to stay in faith. Now, let's make this real simple. Doubt and unbelief comes from the carnal realm or the sense knowledge realm. Meaning what your natural eyes can see what your natural ears can hear that's where doubt and unbelief comes from that's where it originates from that's how it gets into your mind now faith comes from the word of god romans 10:17 says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of god hallelujah the enemies of doubt and unbelief are always going to be let in when you are living a life controlled and dominated by what you can see and hear in this natural realm. Amen. Now, faith is going to prevail whenever you are controlled by what you can see and hear from the word of God. It's as simple as that. And I could end this message right tonight, right now. I could end it and just say to you, stay in the word and you'll stay in faith. We could go home and I've given you I've given you revelation. I've given you the the gist of this message is stay in the word and you'll stay in faith. Now. Uh, <clears throat> doubt and unbelief comes through what you hear and see in the natural realm. And, and what 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 that is, is when you begin to see things and hear things that contradict what the words promised in your life. How many understands that, that you go through that? Amen. You're going to hear things. You're going to see things all the time that contradict what God has promised, what God has said. You know, you're believing that you're healed. You're going to feel pain. You're believing that God's providing in your finances. It's, you know, something's going to tear up or, or, you know, the gas prices are going to keep rising or whatever. You understand what I'm saying? It's just, it, it, and, and you see all that and you focus on all that. And, and those, those thoughts that come in through that, that's your enemies. That's doubt and unbelief. It's contradicting everything the word is trying to tell you and the word is is trying to say to you hallelujah and so our fight then is to stay in faith how do we stay in faith we've got to keep our mind renewed in the word of god why so my faith doesn't waver hallelujah my faith doesn't waver because I'm, I'm, I'm focused on what the word says. I'm focused on what the word of God promises me. The problem with the Christian is today, the only time where the average Christian is renewing their mind in the word is on Sunday morning. But if you're waiting from Sunday morning to Sunday morning to renew your mind, the devil's got six days to get you. 
He don't need six days. Some of you need six minutes and he's got you. Right? You've got to renew your mind. You've got to keep your mind focused in the word of God so that your faith doesn't waver. Why, pastor, why is it important that we've got to fight? And this is what I want to get into. Why is it important that we've got to fight the fight of faith? Why is it important that I've got to be a person that remains in faith and therefore I've got to keep my mind renewed in the word? I've got to keep the word pumping into my eyes and into my ears at all times, whether I'm listening to it, reading it, speaking it, whatever. I've got to keep it in front of me at all times. Why is that? Why is it that I got to do that? Why is it that I got to do that so that I can remain in faith? Why is this faith fight so important? Well, here it is. James chapter one. All right, you ready? Verse five, he gives us a principle here. He says, is if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, right? That gives to all men liberally or freely or generously and upbraideth not meaning without condemnation. God does not rebuke you because you're asking for wisdom. He wants you to ask for wisdom. Nor does he look at you and say, well, you've, you've messed up too much. I can't help you. No, he's generous if you ask him, right? With, if you need, need wisdom. But he gives us a principle here. He says, and it shall be given him, verse 6, but here's the principle. But let him ask in what? Faith. Now, that don't just go for wisdom. That goes for anything else you're asking for. Healing, deliverance, amen, breakthrough, whatever. You've got to ask in faith. And look what else he says. Nothing what? Nothing wavering. And so what he's telling us here is that you've got to ask in unwavering faith. Amen. Now look what the next part says. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Right? Verse 7. Here, here we go. Verse 7. For let not that man. What man? The man that wavers in his faith. Let not that man think what? that he shall receive anything of the Lord. So why is it important that I fight this fight of faith and make sure that I'm staying in faith every day of my life? Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. Why? Because that's the only way, according to the word of God, I'm going to receive anything from God. I'm not going to receive anything from God wavering in my faith one day to the next, one hour to the next, one minute to the next. Does anybody understand what I'm saying? Now, am I saying you should never get down or you should never uh, have fear or whatever? I'm going to tell you like I heard a man say, you can't keep the birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from building a nest in your hair. Now, what does that mean? That means birds are going to fly over your head, but they don't have to nest in your hair. Thoughts of doubt and unbelief and fear are going to come. That's not the issue. The issue is when you let them stay. Come on. And you meditate on those things instead of the word of God. I'm not teaching anything profound. This is very simple. This is the Christian walk right here in essence. Hallelujah. And so you have to learn how not to allow those thoughts of fear and those thoughts of fear and those thoughts of unbelief to rest in your mind and meditate on those things. He said in Philippians, he said, finally, brethren, think on these things. Come on. Amen. Things that are virtuous, things that are good report, things that are praiseworthy. Amen. Hallelujah. Meditate on these things. Set your mind on, on, set your affections on things above and not on things beneath, not on earthly, carnal things, worldly things, things in the flesh. Set your mind on the spirit realm, on the word of God. Hallelujah. And you got to do that every day. You're going to have to do it every day until the day the Lord comes back or until the day you die. You're going to have to get your mind in the word. There is there. Hallelujah. There is not a magic prayer. There is not a magic service. There's not a magic sermon that'll fix everything. It's an everyday 
stay, fighting the fight of faith and endeavoring through the power of the Holy Spirit and through the word of God to remain in faith. Why? Because the only person that's going to receive anything from God is the one that remains in faith. Hallelujah. Amen. You're not going to seek healing and get healing, believing one day that God's healed you and that it's yours and that it's coming. And then the next day, believing you're going to die. And then the next day, well, no, God, God's his word said. And then the, then the next day, go to the doctor and get a bad report and then come home just crying and bawling and writing out your will. Come on. Amen. You're not going to receive healing that way. You have to remain. Let not that man. What man? The man that wavers in his faith. Don't let that man think that he'll receive anything from God. I have to remain in faith. Whatever I'm asking for, whatever I'm believing for, whatever I'm, I'm going after that God has promised me, I have to remain in faith. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, this is important because it could mean life or death, depending on what you're believing for. Right? Isn't this a life or death principle? I mean, if you believe, if the doctor said they can't do nothing else for the cancer, there's no more treatment they can give you, but you know by his stripes you're healed. Well, that's a life and death issue. You better learn how to remain in faith. Come on. And get your healing and get your deliverance. Amen. Amen or oh me. Amen. <laughs> now, James compares. Let me, let me talk to you about what it means to waver. James compares wavering to a wave of the sea. And I've taught on this in here before, but uh, it's good to renew our mind to this. And some of you may not have heard me teach this. But James compares wavering to a wave of the sea. First of all, a wave is controlled by the elements around it. Amen. It's controlled by the elements in the atmosphere. It's controlled by the weather. If the elements around it are calm, then the wave will be calm. The water will be calm. Y'all been to the beach, you know, in certain times and certain temperatures, certain weather patterns, the, the waves and the waters are rough. They're, they're big. They're, they're strong. Other times it's calm because a wave is, is controlled by the elements in the atmosphere. So Someone that's going to waver in their faith is someone that's going to allow their thoughts and emotions and words to be controlled and dictated by the elements around them, by what they're hearing, by what they're seeing, by what they're feeling, by what they see on Facebook or by what they hear in the news. Come on. Amen. When you are controlled in your emotions by that, when you're controlled in your thoughts by that, when your words are controlled by that. Hallelujah. You're a wave. You're a wavering wave of the sea. Let not, I'm going to repeat this, let not that man think that he'll receive anything from God. Listen to me, children of God. What you're going to hear in this teaching tonight, if I can get done with it and get through with it, and I, I usually do, I try, no matter how long it takes me. But, uh, it, what you're going to hear is the, the responsibility to receive from God is not on God. It's on the believer. God's done made up his mind about what he wants to do with you. All of his promises are yes and amen. It's up to the believer to believe for it, to walk in faith and remain in faith and get it. Amen. This is not a shouting message or teaching tonight, but it'll make you shout if you get a hold of it. Now, what else about a wave? A wave uh, rises up and then quickly comes crashing down, doesn't it? People that waver in their faith are people that one minute they're high in faith, ready, believing God. They're shouting and dancing and screaming and yelling at the devil and jumping for joy and doing cartwheels and spinning around. Amen. And then all of a sudden, the next day, you're talking to them and they're just, they've come crashing down and they're, oh God, I don't know if I'm going to make it. I was like, you, 24 hours ago, you were jumping and dancing and, and, and knocking people over, praising God. 
Now all of a sudden you're not, you don't know if you're going to make it. You're a wave. You, you quickly come crashing down. Why? Because you're controlled by the elements. You heard something. Come on. You felt something that just totally knocked all of that faith out of you. And you were here and all of a sudden, boom, you're crashing down. Amen. Let not that man think. Come on, are you seeing this? Come on, let not that. See, a lot of folks are blaming God for why they ain't receiving anything. My God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Me and you are the fickle, you know, uh, people that, 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 that can't remain from one day to the next in faith and in joy and in peace. Because we don't, and I'll tell you what it is, we don't want to renew our mind. We want a quick prayer. We want somebody to prophesy over us. We want to go to a revival service and we want it fixed in one night. And it's awesome when that happens. And that does. I've seen immediate deliverances and immediate miracles. But I, I've seen less of those than I have those miracles that took time because people walked in faith for a while. Hallelujah. And I see them six months later, a year later. They're not where they were. Those are the lasting changes. Are you following what I'm saying? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. If you've ever read Joel Osteen's uh, mother's uh, testimony of being healed from cancer, she, she got so bad she was on the floor spitting up blood in the bathroom. But every morning she got up and quoted faithfully healing scripture after healing scripture every morning for I don't know how long it was. I haven't heard that. I haven't uh, renewed my mind of the testimony in a while, but it was a long time. And then finally, God, the healing manifested in her cancer was was uh, took care of by the power of the Holy Spirit. Are you following what I'm saying? Hallelujah. But it was it was remaining in faith, continuously renewing my mind, her mind to the word of God. Are you understand what I'm saying? She wasn't wavering. She wasn't a wave rising up and crashing down. Hallelujah. So now. <clears throat> thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. But understand something. Faith that is controlled by the circumstances, meaning I believe God's doing something because it looks like God's doing it. That ain't faith. Faith, real faith, is controlled and dictated by the word of God alone by itself. Huh? Remember the centurion? This wasn't in my notes, but uh, the centurion. Jesus was going to come to his house and, and heal his servant, the, the, the army general. Um, he was going to come and, and, and heal his servant who was sick. And he was going to come in the house. And Centurion said, yeah, I'm not worthy to have you come into my house. But I tell you what, Jesus, you ain't even got to come to my house. Just speak the word only. And he will be healed. And Jesus said, this is great faith. I haven't seen great faith like this in all of Israel. Why? Because the centurion's faith needed one thing. The word of God. That's all he needed. He didn't need to see his servant healed. He just needed to hear Jesus speak the word. Hallelujah. Because he had revelation of the authority of the word. Remember, he told Jesus, he said, Jesus, I'm a man under authority just like you. And who I say, when I tell someone to go, they go. And when I tell someone to stay, they stay. He recognized Jesus had authority in his word. And he said, all I need to hear is that authoritative word. Come on, somebody. Great faith. Real faith is faith. All it needs is the word of God. It don't need to see nothing. It don't need to feel nothing. It don't need to hear nothing. Just the word. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. That we, and we've, we've got to get to that place. And, and so it, you're not going to remain in faith if your faith is controlled by what you see. Hallelujah. That's not faith at all. You're never going to get your miracle. You're never going to get your breakthrough. You got to have faith that's based solely on the word of God. That is unwavering faith. Why? Because the word does not change. Your circumstances will change, but the word of God never changes. Somebody say amen. Amen. So if I look at Isaiah 53 and 5 right now, what's it going to say? Those of you that know what it says. I'm healed. Now, if I look at it tomorrow, what's it going to say? 
If I look at it Thursday, what's it going to say? Is it going to be as true Thursday as it is right now? Now, what's my body going to do? My body may, my body may feel worse Thursday than it felt today, but the word doesn't change. Huh? That promise stays the same. Hallelujah. That's why Jesus is the rock. Come on. Hallelujah. That's why he's that high tower. He doesn't move. He doesn't change. He doesn't shift. Hallelujah. Things around Jesus and the word of God may change and shift, but the word never changes. And when I am rooted in the word, hallelujah, I'm rooted in something that will not change. Hallelujah. And so if I, if my, if my anchor, it's my anchor. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on. I said, it's my anchor. Thank you, Jesus. This is my anchor. This is my foundation. That means I can't be moved. Come on, amen. I'm preaching simple truth to you tonight. Very simple truth that we gloss over in the church. Hallelujah. Preaching on all kinds of other stuff we don't need to hear. Hallelujah. <clears throat> amen. Amen. Let me get on with this. Luke chapter 7. Look at this. Luke chapter 7, verse 19. Uh, this is where John the Baptist is, uh, he's in prison. He's having a rough time. He's in, he's been preaching, uh, the coming of the Messiah. He's been preparing the way. He's been baptizing people. He stood against Herod and his wicked, idolatrous, uh, uh relationship that he had with this woman. And, and he let him hear about it. And now here's John the Baptist. He's been put in prison. He's about to be beheaded, and he's struggling in his faith. He's starting to waver, and he's wondering, he's wondering, is Jesus the Messiah? Is he the one that is to come, that was prophesied about, the one that he prepared the way for? Um, and it says in Luke 7, 19, it says, John calling unto him two of his disciples sent them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? Hallelujah. Now, this, this makes sense that he'd be questioning this, because think about it. He, here's John the Baptist. He's thinking, I'm about to be killed for this guy. This better be the guy. <laughs> you don't understand what I'm saying? Amen. And he's going through, listen, persecution will, 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 uh, uh, hit your faith it, it 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 can make your faith waver come on amen when persecution comes hallelujah and so here here is johnny's in the middle of this persecution and he wants to make sure his faith is wavering i mean he didn't he hear god in an audible voice when jesus come up out of the river saying this is my son in whom I am well pleased. So, and, the, and the dove came down and ascended on. So if John the Baptist, who saw something so miraculous and supernatural as that, but then his faith starts to waver in persecution, come on, what do you think is going to happen to our faith? Amen. You hear what I'm saying? So now, here's John and his faith is wavering. And look what Jesus does. He sends, John sends these disciples to Jesus to say, are, are you the one or should we look for another? And look at what happens in verse 20. It says, when the men were come unto him, they said, John uh, Baptist hath sent us unto thee, saying, art thou he that should come or look we for another? And in that same hour, look what Jesus did. He cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits and unto many that were blind he gave sight. So here's what Jesus does. When these men come from John the Baptist saying, are you the one or should we look for another? John's asking. His face wavering. Jesus grabs these men. He don't say nothing to them and he just starts healing people and delivering people. He's like, he says, come here, watch this. And he starts opening blinded eyes and he starts making the deaf to hear and he starts casting out devils and, and all of this stuff, right? Then he says to them in verse 22, it says, Jesus answered and said unto them, now go your way and tell John what things you've seen and heard and how the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, 
the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and to the poor the gospel is preached. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. So he grabs John's disciples, starts healing people. Then once he gets done healing and delivering people and preaching, he tells them, go tell John what you saw, right? And then tell him, quit being ashamed of me. In other words, says, go tell him what you saw and tell him to quit whining and crying and get his head up. <laughs> Amen. Because I, I am, you know, I, 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 quit being ashamed of me, right? Now, after they leave, watch what Jesus says about John. He goes into this long discourse about John. He says, and when the messengers of John were departed, he began to speak to the people concerning John. What went you out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaking with the wind? But what went you out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they which are gorgeously appareled and live delicately are in king's courts. But what went out for you to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and much more than a prophet. It. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. So here's Jesus, John struggling in prison with his faith. And he and all he does is heals a bunch of people in front of John's disciples. And then he tells his disciples to go tell him, go tell John what you've seen and tell him, don't be ashamed of me. And then after they leave, he gives this great discourse about how great of a prophet John is and, and really begins to build John up. Amen. Now, it looks like to me, John could have really used that speech. Huh? Don't it look like to you that John could have really used that speech from Jesus? But watch this. Jesus didn't send his disciples back with that speech. He sent them back with something greater and stronger than that speech. Are you hearing me? What did he send them back with? Listen, all of the things that Jesus did when he healed those people and delivered those people in front of John's disciples, all of these things, watch this, were things that were prophesied in the word of God that the true Messiah would accomplish. So watch this. What Jesus gave John the Baptist when his faith was wavering was confirmation from the word of God. John didn't need a build him up speech. He didn't need a pumping up. What he needed was the word of God. When your faith is wavering, you don't need somebody to hug you and pat you on the back and tell you it's going to be all right. You need of the word of God. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Why? What was going to be greater? What was going to be more sustaining to John? A, a speech about how great he was? That didn't answer anything for John. That didn't answer that this was the Messiah. That didn't answer that everything he did was what God wanted him to do and he did the right thing and he was in the... No. What was going to confirm to him and cause him to stand and have peace in the middle of persecution when they was getting ready to behead him? What was going to give him in peace and strength was confirmation from the word of God. When they went back and said, man, the blind eyes are being opened, the dead are being raised, the deaf are hearing, John said, oh, this is the one. How did he know? Because it was the word of God. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, when your faith is wavering, when you're going through it, you need the word of God. You need the word in your life. You need the word to come to you and confirm to you that, yes, no, I know I'm feeling bad right now, but let me get in the word. Yeah, I am healed by his stripes. I was healed. Hallelujah. He bore my sins in his body and with his stripes I were healed. Hallelujah. Come on. His will for me is to prosper and be in, I'm sorry, be in health and prosper even as my soul prospers hallelujah amen when you're going through it listen i've had the build me up speeches and they they worked for a little bit but then they wore off and and i forgot he, who even said anything and what they said hallelujah and i lost the cards amen <laughs> There's cards I got 20 years ago that were great cards, and when I read them, it was just like, oh, man, this really makes me feel, I don't even know where the card's at right now. 
Amen. You understand what I'm saying? What, what are you talking about? What's going to keep me? What's going to keep me through all the persecution? What's going to keep me through everything I'm going through is the word of God. What's going to cause me to stand and remain in faith? He that wavers, don't let that man think he'll receive anything from God. But what's going to get me healed? What's going to get me delivered? What's going to get me set free is remaining in faith. And what's going to cause me to remain in faith? The word of God. Amen. Renewing my mind in the word of God. Amen. That's why, listen, if you tell me you're believing for something, but you can't give me a word that you're standing on, you ain't believing. And you ain't going to remain in faith and you're not going to see that thing come to pass. If you're telling me you're believing for something, then you need to be able to tell me what scripture you're standing on. What promise are you standing on? What is it when your faith starts to waver that you can go to and renew your mind to and say, and get back in your faith? Come on, amen. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Are you receiving tonight? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> If we're not receiving anything from God, watch this please. If we're not receiving anything from God, whether it be a miracle, a healing, our answer, wisdom, it's never an issue with God's ability, nor is it an issue with God's will. It's an issue with our doubt and unbelief. Hallelujah. It's never an issue with God's ability, and that'll pretty much pass in any church. But when it comes to saying it's, 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 it's never an issue with God's will, that it's always God's will for you to be healed. It's always God's will for you to receive what he's promised in his word. That's an issue in some churches because a lot of churches don't believe it's always God's will because they're basing things on experience and not the word of God. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. It's never an issue. It's always God's will for you to be healed, delivered, get your miracle, get set free. And if you don't receive, the issue is your doubt and unbelief. Now, this is a hard pill to swallow because... Yes, I'm saying to us that if we don't get healed, that if we don't see God move in our life, it is our fault. Amen. Now, I'm going to stand flat-footed, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand right here, and I'm going to say it. It is our fault. Now, this, this is true only if we're asking and believing for things that the grace of God's provided through Jesus. If you're believing for something that God did not provide through the, the blood of Jesus, uh, <laughs> you're, you're, you're not going to get that. And that's because it wasn't, you know, if you're praying for somebody else's wife, well, God didn't provide you somebody else's wife. Amen. If you're praying for a Lamborghini just because you want a Lamborghini, God's probably not going to give you that Lamborghini. I don't know if that's just something, you know. It, 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 the Bible says you have not because you ask not, and you, and you receive not because you ask amiss, James says, what, to consume it up on the lust of your flesh. If you're asking for something just because your flesh is desiring it, that's not, but anything God has provided through the sacrifice of the blood of Jesus, it's yours. And it's his will for you to get it. And if you don't get it, it's not because he didn't want you to have it. It's an issue in your life in the area of doubt and unbelief. And I'm not going to say faith. I'm going to say in the area of doubt and unbelief, and you'll see why. Amen. If you can amen me, amen. If, if, you can't, if you can't amen me right now, maybe you will later. Just, just say, okay. We'll think about it. <laughs> amen. Hallelujah. Now, if it, now, there are things like uh, career, ministry. Those are things you need to pray for God's will. 
God, if it be your will. Because um, these are things that, it, it, you know, you, you have to seek God's will on. It may not be God's will for you to have that other job, or it may not be God's will for you to do that ministry. And you have to seek God's will on that. And that's where you pray, Lord, if it be your will. All right. But when it comes to healing children of God, when it comes to miracles, when it comes to deliverance, when it comes to wisdom, when it comes to things of that nature. Hallelujah. God's already expressed his will for us in the word of God. If he didn't want us healed, delivered, set free, should have never sent Jesus. Amen. All right. Hallelujah. Now. So what are you saying, Pastor? If God doesn't move, then are you saying I didn't have enough faith? No, that's not what I said. You have enough faith. You have en you've had enough faith to get any miracle you need because remember the faith you got saved with is the faith that gives you the victory. It's the faith that'll get you healed. It's the faith that'll get you delivered. It's the faith that'll get you set free. Hallelujah. Remember, we taught on that. First John 5 and 4, it says, 4 and 5, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our what? faith and who is he that overcomes the world but he that believes that Jesus is the son of God if you put those two verses together then you understand that the faith that overcomes the world is the faith it took to believe in Jesus amen so it's not an issue of you having enough faith you've got enough faith you got saved by enough faith and that faith you got saved by is enough faith to get you healed. It's enough faith to get you delivered. It's enough faith to get you your miracle. You've got enough faith. Matter of fact, you've got the same faith that Jesus had. I don't have, I don't have you know, I can't go into all those scriptures. One day we'll talk about that. But you've got the same faith Jesus has. Matter of fact, you've got the same faith the apostles has. Amen. Peter, Peter was writing to the church and he said those of like precious faith. The same faith that Peter had. Peter had that faith that his shadow healed people when they was walking down the street. You've got that faith. Hallelujah. This life that I live, I live yet not I, but I live by the faith of the Son of God, Paul said. That's Galatians, uh, Galatians chapter 3, I believe, or Galatians chapter 2. Hallelujah. But he said, I live by not faith in, the King James says, faith of, the, same, the faith of Jesus. I have that same faith. Amen. You've got enough faith. That's my point. Somebody say, I've got enough faith. It's not a faith issue. Hallelujah. The faith you got saved by is the faith you will get delivered by. Hallelujah. Amen. You, somebody say, I got enough faith. Listen, the faith it takes to come up in a prayer line is enough faith to get you healed. The faith it takes to say the name of Jesus over a situation is enough faith to get you delivered. Amen. Quit thinking it's a faith issue. It's not a faith issue. It's a doubt and unbelief issue. And I'm going to try to show this to you before we leave. Hallelujah. Remember the Bible says, and I'm going to quote this scripture again, but remember the Bible says mustard seed faith. You don't need this great amount of faith. What's the Bible say? You need faith the size of a mustard seed. Have you ever seen a mustard seed? Come on. It's so small that you, you, can, you can lose it in the, in the crevice of your hand. Right? So it's not about, watch this, children of God. It's not about the size of faith. The faith, how many believes that it's faith, if, if, if I say, you, do you need healing, and you come up here and, 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 and stand in, up here to get healed, you've released mustard seed faith. Well, all I did was walk up there. It's mustard seed faith. The mustard seed is tiny, but the Bible talks about when you plant it, it grows into something that gives birds shade. Come on, amen. It's a seed. Faith is a seed. So I didn't know I was going to teach on this, but faith is a seed. A seed has to be sown. So faith has to be sown. It has to be released. So when I get up to come in the prayer line, I'm releasing that mustard seed faith. When I get up and speak the name of Jesus... 
in the name of Jesus. And that don't sound like much. That's mustard seed faith. But that the Bible says that's enough. It's enough to move a mountain. It's enough to pluck up a sycamine tree. You know, sycamine tree by the roots, the Bible says. Sycamine tree roots, you know how many years they grow? They can grow for two to three hundred years in the ground. That's, that's deep. But mustard seed faith can pluck it up. Are you following what I'm saying? Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And so, and so you don't, it's not about having enough faith. That's not the issue. Hallelujah. <clears throat> it's about having too much doubt and unbelief. Can I say that again? It's not about ha not having enough faith. It's about having too much doubt and unbelief. Doubt and unbelief will act many times as a counterweight to your faith. What are you talking about? If I took, if I took, a, if I took a truck and, and, and hooked it up to a, a, a sled, a, a something, and I hooked it up with a chain, and I started pulling it, but then I hooked another truck up to the other side of the way and, and, told, and, and got that truck to pull it the other way. What's going to happen to that thing I'm trying to pull? Huh? It, it's going to stall right in the middle. So faith acts as, uh, uh, let me give you a definition of faith. When you're operating in faith, when you release that mustard seed faith, coming up to a prayer line, speaking the name of Jesus, whatever it is. You are reaching into the spirit realm and you are latching on to the miracle that you are releasing faith for. The thing that God's promised you and the, that the blood has provided, you are latching on to it. And as, as long as you remain in faith, amen, and don't waver, you'll pull that thing into manifestation. Now, now sometimes you can pull it in immediately, amen. Amen. It's easy to remain in faith when you get healed in three seconds. How many could remain in faith for three seconds? Three minutes? Anybody, can I get three minutes? Maybe, can I get 30? Anybody got 30? Can I get 35, 35, 37? You got 30, you can go 37. Anybody, for no. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? It's easy to remain in faith when it, when, you, when it manifests quick. But when it takes three weeks, three months, a year, come on, amen, it's hard to remain in faith until you pull it into manifestation. So what begins to happen? We begin to waver. We begin to look at, and, well, this ain't happening. God must not be moving, and this didn't happen. God must not be You know what you've done? Doubt and unbelief has hooked up to the other side of that miracle, and it's pulling it the other way, and it's getting stalled in the supernatural. Some of you got miracles that are stalled right now in the supernatural because your doubt and unbelief got hooked to the other side. Come on, amen. And you ain't remained in faith. Are you seeing this? Say this, understand, say this with me. It's not about uh, having enough faith. It's about having too much doubt and unbelief. Amen. Hallelujah. And it's a hard pill. Are y'all still with me? It's a hard pill to swallow knowing that... Pastor, man, pastor, I don't know about all, you know, you're telling me it, you're telling me it's our fault. It's, it's our fault if we don't get our miracle. It's our fault. It's our doubt and unbelief if somebody doesn't get, or if, or if we don't get a healing, or if we don't get deliverance, or we don't get set free, or if a miracle doesn't happen. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, and that's a hard pill to swallow, but it's a freeing pill. What do you mean? I'd rather know that I could be the reason I don't get a miracle because that lets me know that my miracles are not up to chance or whether or not God wants to give me one. It's up to me and my faith. I'd rather it be up to me and my faith and me not get one than it to be up to something else. Because at least I know that when I get into a situation that is too big for me to get out, I got faith. Hallelujah. That can get me out of it. 
And all I got to do is operate in faith. And if I'll remain in faith long enough, come on, and renew my mind to the word, I can change the situation. Boy, that's, that's liberating. That means I don't have to stay stuck by the enemy. I don't have to stay defeated by what I'm going through. Somebody say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Now, is it hard to think that when I had my, uh, when, when we had our first daughter and she lived 32 hours and I was believing for a miracle and the miracle didn't happen and she died and we buried her, is it hard to think that uh, she didn't get her miracle because of me? Well, yeah, that's hard to think because I look back on it and you can pretty it up and you can get all the religious stuff. You Well, God needed another flower and God wanted, you know, God just wanted to give her to us for a little. Now, shut up with all that stuff. And none of that stuff makes anybody feel any better. The reason that I didn't get my miracle is because I didn't know how to walk in faith. Now, is that a hard pill to swallow? Yes. Is it a hard pill to swallow to know that I could have a 19-year-old a, a girl, uh, uh, you know, getting ready to go to college right now? Yeah. And I don't have, yeah, that's a hard pill to swallow. But I'd rather swallow that pill and know that my faith can turn things around than to think that I could believe God and God would just not do it. Are you hearing what I'm saying? That I could just believe God and he wouldn't move and he wouldn't take care of things and he wouldn't straight think, no, 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 I don't want to believe that. I want to believe that my faith can change things. My faith can turn things around. Come on, somebody. Amen. Amen. And it's not so bad to think about it because what's the other option of, of her not getting her miracle and us not having a daughter? <laughs> She's beating me right now. She's where I'm trying to go. So you mean, I mean, if, you, if you're believing for healing in your body and you don't get it, what's the other option? Heaven. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> See ya. <laughs> and I ain't going to think about you either. I'm going to be running in my new body, worshiping Jesus, and, and, and I hope you all see me soon. Amen. <laughs> Amen. But listen, I'm going to believe God. Are you following what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Amen. Amen. Uh, let's see. Let's go to, um, you, can y'all handle something else real quick? So uh, let, me, let me try to deal with this as quick as I can. Matthew, um, let's skip Matthew 13. Let's skip Mark 6. Let's go to Mark uh, 9, Tosh. Mark chapter 9. Where I'm going to read Jesus um, and, and I'm going to end with this story. Jesus, Peter, James, and John have went up on the mountain of transfiguration. How many knows what, what I'm talking about, the mountain of transfiguration? Peter, James, and John, and Jesus went up on the mountain of transfiguration to pray. They've left all the other disciples down below. And there's a multitude that's gathered uh, down in the valley with the other <clears throat> disciples they've gathered there they're looking for jesus they're ready to be taught and healed and prayed for and so in this text that we're about to read jesus and and peter and john is coming back from the mountain and and they're met with a father whose boy is uh, uh vexed with the devil so look at what this says mark chapter 9 and let me let me reiterate this it's not about having enough faith it's about having too much doubt and unbelief that that counteracts that and and causes you not to get your miracle i'll show you this in the scripture mark chapter 9 verse 17 it says and one of the multitude answered and said master i've brought unto you my son which hath a dumb spirit and uh, whithersoever he taketh him he teareth him and he foameth and gnasheth with his teeth and pineth away and I spake to, the, to, to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. So he had already brought the boy to Jesus' disciples to be delivered. This is while Jesus is up on the mountain with Peter, James, and John. Well, Jesus comes down, and the father's like, I've got my boy here. He's battling with a demon. This demon's trying to take him out. Your disciples couldn't cast him out, right? Verse 19. Now look at what Jesus says. Now, you, wouldn't ha you would not like Jesus for a pastor. I'm going to tell you that right now. 
Verse 19, he answers and said to them, O faithless generation, <laughs> how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you or put up with you, right? Bring him unto me. What if I walked in here one day and said, you bunch of faithless people, how long do I got to preach to you? <laughs> right? Amen. I've never felt like saying that, though. <clears throat> <laughs> no <laughs> no I, I'm listen we're all growing here amen I, 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 I get I waver I, every now and then too all right but but Jesus says you faithless bunch of people how long how long shall I be with you how long shall I suffer well he's trying to get them ready because he's he's gonna be leaving them and they're gonna be taking over he's trying to get them ready he's got three he's got a short time to do it he says Bring him unto me, right? They bring the boy unto me. And they brought him unto him. And when he saw him, straightway the spirit uh, tear him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming. It, it, it kind of gives you the picture of a seizure that's going on, but it's demonic. And he asked his father, Jesus asked the father, how long is it ago since this came unto him and he said well of a child now I don't know how old he is now but it, it, evidently it's been a quite a while and he says oft times it's cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him so this demon would jump on him and and throw him down when he's around a fire or when he's around water trying to burn him or or um, drown him and they've had to you know watch after him um <clears throat> Let's see, oft times it casts him the fire and water to destroy him. But, it, but look at what the Father says. If you can do anything, right, if you've got the power, right, and have compassion on us, if, if you've got the power and if you care about us, right, then help us. Jesus said unto him, if you can what? Believe. If you can believe, all things are possible to him that what? So Jesus said, Jesus was letting him know that, and he's letting us know that it's not a question of my ability nor my compassion. God healing you or delivering you is never a question of his ability or the fact uh, whether or not he loves you. Hallelujah. There's no question in that. He loves you. He loved you enough to send Jesus. Amen. And it's not a question of his ability. He's letting us know the question is, can you believe? All things are possible if you can what? Believe. believe. Amen. That's the issue. Can you believe? That's what he's telling this man. Verse 24. Now, look what the man says. And straightway the father of the child cried out. Listen to me, please. This is very important. And said with tears, Lord, watch what he says. I believe. Help my what? So this father had belief and unbelief at the same time. Now, I, I don't believe that if I don't believe that if you, you know, if you have fear, you don't have faith or if you have faith, you don't have fear. I believe you can have faith and fear at the same time. You can have belief and unbelief at the same time. Hallelujah. That's what this man had. This man had this man had faith and he had unbelief at the same time understand something how do you know that the father had faith well didn't he bring him to Jesus isn't that mustard seed faith that's enough faith to get so if, if he didn't bring him to Jesus he that it, it, you know if he didn't believe he would never brought him to Jesus so he had faith but what else did he have he, he had unbelief Hallelujah. He had unbelief and his unbelief. And as you're going to see, the disciples unbelief was counteracting the faith. And, 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 and he had enough faith, but he had too much unbelief. The disciples, you're going to see, had enough faith, but they had too much unbelief. Verse 25. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, You dumb and deaf spirit, I charge you, come out of him and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried, 
and rent him sore and came out of him and he was as one dead in so much that many said he's dead. So when the devil come out of this boy, he come out with screaming, he threw him down and the boy laid there like he was dead. Everybody around thought that, that, the, that the devil had killed him, right? And it says, and when, I'm sorry, but Jesus, verse 27, took him, took the boy by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. Amen. And when he was coming to the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could not we cast him out? Now, this is the answer Jesus gave them, but I want to give you the answer he gave from Matthew's gospel. It's the same account. It's just Matthew's account. Matthew 17, 19. I'm almost done. Jesus said, then came the disciples. This is the same account, same boy. Just a different answer. I want, I want to get this answer here that, Jesus, that Matthew recorded. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, because of your what? Because of your unbelief. Notice he did not say because God didn't want the devil to come out at that time. Nor did he say because you didn't have enough faith. Huh? What did he say? Your issue was your unbelief. Hallelujah. Amen. They had enough faith because already the disciples had learned that the devils were subject to them. Remember, they come back to Jesus saying, man, the devils are subject to us. And he says, don't rejoice because the devils are subject unto you. Rejoice because your name's written in the Lamb's book of life. They'd already been casting devils out through the authority of the name of Jesus. So they had the faith to cast this devil out. That's the whole reason they were saying, well, why couldn't we? Because they'd already been doing it. And they said, why couldn't we cast them out? Jesus didn't say because you don't have enough faith. They had enough faith. He said they had too much what? Hmm. They had too much unbelief. Thank you, Jesus. It's not an issue of your faith. It's an issue of your unbelief. And then look what he says in the rest of that verse. It's the one I've been quoting today. For verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a what? Mustard seed. You shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. So what's he telling them here? The same thing I've been telling you. You all had enough faith because all it takes is a mustard seed size faith. But that wasn't the problem. The mustard, your mustard seed size faith wasn't the problem. It was your giant size unbelief that counteracted the mustard seed faith. You had enough faith when you said, come out in, in Jesus' name. That was enough to get the devil out. But it was your giant size unbelief. Amen. Now watch this. Where did this unbelief come from? Verse 21, look at what Jesus said. He then says, how be it this kind, this, this kind of, of devil goeth not out but by what? Now, Jesus enlightens us to something. And it's not, this is not what Jesus was saying. Jesus was not saying there are some devils that are special devils that require fasting and prayer. All devils come out by the name of Jesus and faith in that name. There's not a special devil that's harder to get out than others. They all come out by the faith in the name of Jesus. What Jesus was saying here about prayer and fasting, prayer and fasting is not for the devil. Prayer and fasting is for you. Prayer, the prayer and fasting is for you to build your faith and to watch this. Here's what prayer, here, here's, here, here's your fasting message and I don't have to do a series on it. I'm going to give it to you in two minutes. Are you ready? Here's, here's your message on fasting. Here's the power of fasting. Fasting and prayer, when you combine it together, and then you combine it with the word, because if you're fasting, you should be fasting to get into the word. You shouldn't be fasting just not to eat. It means I'm fasting, I'm pushing back the plate, and I'm not eating so that I can spend time in the word. Now, when I fast, 
I, if I'm fasting, I don't want to hang out with anybody. I don't want to watch TV because every other commercial on television is a burger, a pizza, a steak, uh, something. Amen. So why would I want to watch that if I'm trying not to eat and I'm trying so that if I'm fasting, what that fasting does, it shuts the television off. It keeps people from coming over. It puts me in my room. It puts me by myself. What am I going to do? I'm going to get into the word of God. That's what fasting's for. And what does it do? Watch this, the, the power of prayer and fasting, cutting off friends, cutting off the television, cutting off food so I can get into the word and then I can get into the prayer. It puts me into the spirit realm and the power of fasting and praying is it desensitizes myself to the carnal realm. When I fast and pray, I'm deadening my carnal senses to the carnal realm. Where does doubt and unbelief come from? It comes from the carnal realm. It's produced by my physical senses. And so what I'm doing is I'm deadening my physical senses to the carnal realm, but I am sensitizing my spiritual sense to the spirit realm. Are you following what I'm saying? Hallelujah. I'm, I'm sensitizing my spirit to the spirit realm, to the word of God where faith is produced. The carnal realm is where doubts produced. So I cut myself off from that realm through prayer and fasting. And then I get myself into the word and prayer, which builds my faith. Come on. Amen. The reason that the disciples had enough faith, but too much doubt and unbelief is because Oh, let me say it this way. Let me say it this way. All right. So, where where does where does where does my doubt and unbelief come from? It comes from the carnal realm. So, as long as I'm sensitive to the carnal realm, I'm about to walk away from my notes and teach this. I think I think I can teach this better away from my notes. If if I'm fasting and praying, all right, I'm cutting myself off to the carnal realm. I'm cutting myself off to that realm of doubt and unbelief. My doubt and unbelief can't be built. As long as I'm, I'm, I'm not in that carnal sense realm. But when I'm in the spirit realm and I'm in the word, right, my faith is being built. All right. So the issue with the father, the reason why he says, I believe, he had enough faith. That was seen and he brought the son to Jesus. But he said, help my unbelief. Where'd the unbelief come from? Remember when Jesus said, how long has, how long has your son been in this? And he said, man, from a child. And he said, oft times I've seen this devil throw him in the fire and try to throw him in the water. Where did the unbelief come from? It come from all that time of watching that devil do this to his son. Why do you think it's hard for people that's been sick for years to get their miracle? Because they've experienced it for years, and all those years of experiencing it is built up all of this unbelief. So here you come in the middle of your uh, sickness, in the middle of your battle. It doesn't even have to be sickness. It could be anything. You come to God, and you start learning faith, and then you start learning about healing and deliverance. But you want an immediate miracle. You want an immediate just change. But the problem is you've spent 15 years looking at that devil and that problem, you've spent 15 days in the word. Huh? So what's happening? You've got enough faith. You just still got too much doubt and unbelief that's been built up. So what does that mean? I got to take time. This kind comes not out but by prayer and, and fasting. So what Jesus was saying was that this kind of devil, I got to hurry. This kind of devil comes out not, not but by, you got to be somebody that's been praying and fasting and not sensitive to the, the carnal realm. Because what did this devil do? When this devil came out, what did he do? What did that devil do when Jesus tried to cast him out? Threw him down, screamed, and he laid there like he was dead. I guarantee you that devil did the same thing when the disciples tried to cast him out. But the difference between the disciples and Jesus is the disciples were moved by the carnal realm. They saw the boy fall down. They saw him lay there like he was dead. They seen that devil scream, and they, they believed the devil didn't come out. That's his my interpretation, right? 
And so their unbelief kept that devil in there. But now when that devil did it to Jesus, Jesus just walked over and picked him up by the hands. He knew that devil had to go. No matter what that devil did, he could flop around and scream and squall and everything, but he had to go when Jesus said go. So he walked over and just raked him up by the hand. He, Jesus wasn't moved by the sense knowledge realm, by what he saw. So there was no unbelief there in Jesus to counteract his faith, but there was in the disciples. Now, what was the difference? Jesus prayed and fasted, didn't he? I mean, 40 days and 40 nights he fasted in the beginning of his ministry, not to, tell, not to mention how many other times he prayed and fasted. Now, the disciples didn't pray and fast. Remember, John the Baptist came to Jesus, or I'm sorry, the disciples of John the Baptist came to Jesus, or came to John. I'm sorry, let me get my, my theology right. They came to John and said, John, why are, who did they come to? To come to Jesus, that's right. The, the disciples of John the Baptist come to Jesus and said, Jesus, why don't your disciples fast? He says, because I'm with them. Now, when I leave, they'll pray and fast. So Jesus confirmed the disciples never prayed and fasted. So their carnal senses wasn't deadened enough to the sense knowledge realm. So when that boy screamed and cried and squalled and the devil threw him down, they were, oh, no. That's, that's what happens a lot of times when, when you get in church services and people are casting out devils. They tell the devil to go, and then the devil starts screaming and squalling and crying, and then 30 people jump on them because they think that devil didn't do anything. And they think they got to throw them down and pour oil on them and slap them with Bibles and put crucifixes on them to get the devil out. No, you just tell the devil to go. He may scream and scream and squall and cry for, for 30 minutes, but it's, it's got to go. That's faith, right? Are you following what I'm saying? Hallelujah. And so the reason people are not getting healed and not getting their miracle is because their, their unbelief has been built up more than their faith. Huh? Amen. So I'm telling you, okay, I got, I'm, I got a hush. Have I done a decent job tonight? Hallelujah. I hope so. So when you, when, okay, when you release your faith for something, you cannot sit by and watch and see if it happens. You have to believe it's done no matter what it looks like because when you look for the manifestation and you don't see it right away, that's when unbelief sets in and that, that cancels out your faith, right? And, and here's the other thing, children of God. Okay, I believe, I I. I love what God's doing in this church, and I'm believing for miracles. I'm believing for, for things to happen right in the middle of our church services. And I'm believing for things. I'm believing for, for just, you know, um, Pastor Marvin come here and he prophesied about suddenly seasons. You're going to come into all of a sudden, you know, things are going to happen. I really believe that. But what I also believe is just as important that we need to begin to get a mindset for is not just immediate miracles or, or, or immediate just turnarounds, but just getting in our mind to, to, to go, after, go after our miracle through faith and just work on building our faith up. More than focusing on the uh, when's this thing going to manifest focus on building your faith and getting rid of the doubt and unbelief focus more on that focus on focus more on on really <clears throat> what do I want to say any, anything, anything you feed will live. Anything you starve will die. Right? And focus on starving the unbelief in your life. Focus on starving the doubt. Meaning, I'm going to cut myself off from anything that's feeding doubt and unbelief in my life. And just spend time because that's what, that's what it is. You know, if you get rid of that doubt and unbelief that's been built up for years and get rid of it, then it'll, it'll take one service of you coming up into a prayer line and all of a sudden. 
you'll get, you'll get healed. But the focus, the focus needs to be quit. Th one of the things the other day the Lord spoke to me, and I know I got a hush, hallelujah. I get going and I... The other things the Lord spoke to me the other day was because it's never a, a, a matter of not having enough faith. The other the day, I just started thanking God for giving me the faith. Lord, I thank you that I have, I thank you for giving me the faith to be healed. Because he did, he gave me his faith. And I started, I just started thanking him. You know, little things like that, because that gets in your mindset, I've got the faith to be healed. Right? And just focus on, focus on getting rid of all of that doubt and unbelief that's been built up over the years. Right? Because you've looked at the problem, you've looked at the issue for years, and, it, and you felt it, and you felt it, and that's why it's so hard to believe, you know? Because that old, it's like an old friend that's hung around for years. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's like you're building him a room. It's like, no, go tear his room down. Kick him out. <laughs> he don't belong there. He's not your old buddy. Amen. Amen. It's part of the curse. It's part of the part of the part of hell and needs to go back to hell where it came from. Amen. And and so and here's the other thing. People are wanting watch this now. People are wanting miracles, but but they've learned to adapt to their curse. Their life is kind of built around that curse. Right? And so then you've got to learn to start getting a vision for a life without this thing. What does my life look like without this? Come on, amen. Not constantly thinking about what is my life going to be like with this, but what does my life look like without this? getting rid what am I doing I'm getting rid of the doubt and the unbelief I'm getting rid of what's trying to cancel out my faith amen amen and hey pray and fast what better way that's the that's the formula that Jesus gave us to get rid of the doubt and unbelief prayer and fasting cut your senses off to the natural realm right I know as soon as I say fasting you get hungry <laughs> Some of you, your stomach started growling when I said fasting. Started thinking about, man, what am I going to go home and eat? <laughs> right? <laughs> right? But, but prayer and fasting is that way to kill the carnal senses and to deaden that where the realm where the doubt and unbelief comes from, which is what's going to uh, counteract my faith. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Have you received tonight? Thank you, Jesus. God, I give you glory. I give you praise. I give you praise. I'm trying to see if the Lord wants to say anything else. But I shut up.